Welcome to Engineering Studio with Dr. Mohammad Tahir. From this video, we are going to start a new chapter, Design of Foundations. In this chapter, we will cover following contents, type of foundations, limit states or failure modes and design considerations, general procedure for footing design, design of isolated footing subjected to concentric loads, design of isolated footing subjected to eccentric loads, design of combined footings. In this video, we will cover the first topic, which is design, which is type of foundations. So first of all, what is footing or foundations? So it is a part of structure which transmit load from structure to the underlying soil. So it transmit load from superstructure to the soil. So the load of the superstructure is transmitted to the soil. So it spread the structure load over sufficiently large area or stratum to minimize the bearing pressure. The main purpose of foundation is to spread the load over larger area. If this column is directly resting on the soil, so in that case the pressure or the contact pressure under this column will be sufficiently large or it will be larger than that of allowable bearing capacity and as a result the soil underneath this column will fail. So to avoid the failure of the soil, what we do, we spread this load over a larger area to minimize the contact pressure. To minimize the contact pressure to such an extent that it should be less than the allowable bearing capacity of soil. So if we spread this load over a larger area, so in that case this contact pressure will be less than the allowable bearing capacity of the soil. So as a result, our soil will be safe and our structure will also be safe. So next is types of footing. So first of all, bad footing are isolated footings. So these are footing which resist the load of a single column. So here we can see every column have a separate foundation. So this type of footing is termed as bad or isolated footing. So it is the cheapest and the simplest footing. It is used when soil is relatively strong or when column loads are relatively light. So required area footing is less. So as the applied load is less or the soil is strong, as a result the required area footing will be less. And if the columns are at a sufficient distance, center to center, so in that case the distance between or the clear distance between these footings will be sufficient and we can separate the footing of all the columns. So normally square or rectangular shapes in plane are used for isolated footings. So if we talk in the elevations, so it can be either rectangular or it can be stepped like this or it can be tapered. like this. The thickness goes on increasing toward the column, toward the face of the column. The next is combined footing. So it is used when two columns are close to each other. The first case is if these two columns are close to each other and the space between the isolated footings of these two columns is very less. So in that case, to minimize the farm work cost, we can combine these two isolated footings to make a combined footing. So used when columns have differential settlement. If there is a chance of differential settlement for these two columns, so in that case we can combine these two columns to have a uniform pressure or constant pressure underneath these two columns and as a result the differential settlement can be somehow avoided. So combine the footing to form a continuous base. So we combine the footings, isolated footings for these two columns to make a continuous base and the base is to be arranged so that the centroid of base coincide with the resultant of the load to provide uniform pressure on the soil. So while designing these combined footing, we decide the area as well as the shape of this footing such that the resultant of the load and the centroid of this footing should coincide. How for example, if we have a footing like this, combined footing, 
and load is acting over here, over here, and the resultant passes from this point. So in that case, if it is passing through the centroid, the pressure underneath this footing will be uniform. But in case of edge column, if we have a edge column like this, one column over here and the other column over here, so in that case, the resultant will be, if both the column load are same, the resultant will be halfway between these two columns and the centroid may lie over here. So in that case, we need to shift this centroid toward this direction. So to do that, what we can do, we can increase the area and we can make a trapezoidal shape. So one column over here and other column over here. So in that case, the centroid as well as the applied load can coincide. So we can decide the shape of the footing based on the concept that the applied load should coincide with the centroid of footing. So in that case, the resultant pressure or the contact pressure under this footing will be uniform. The third type of footing is strap footing. So it is used when the base of, a, of an exterior column must not project beyond the property line. So if we have a edge column and we cannot extend the footing beyond this edge, it is the end of the property. So in that case, there will be eccentricity of load for this footing. So load is acting over here and the centroid is over here. So in that case, there will be non-uniform pressure under this footing. And this footing can overturn. So to avoid the overturning of such type of footing, we can combine this footing with the footing of interior column or we can join these two footings with the help of a strap beam. So if we join these two footing, the footing of interior column and the edge column with the help of a strap beam, so then this type of footing will be termed as strap footing. Strap beam is constructed between exterior footing and adjacent interior footing. The purpose of strap to restrain overturning force due to load eccentricity on the exterior footing. Base area of the footing are proportioned based on the bearing pressure. So the area of this footing as well as the area of this footing will be decided based on the bearing pressure. The bearing pressure under this footing as well as under this footing should be less than the allowable bearing capacity. Resultant of the loads on the two footings should pass through the centroid of the area. So the resultant of these two loads, the load on this column as well as on this column should pass through the centroid of this area area of this one and area of this one. If we combine these two areas, so it should pass through the centroid of these two areas. So we need this assumption or we need this consideration to have the constant pressure under these footings. The strap beam between the two footings should not bear against the soil. So this strap beam should not resist any pressure or there should be no contact pressure at this strap footing. So far to avoid the pressure on this strap footing, we can do it like this. Construct a footing over here, edge footing and the other footing here. But the strap should be started at, at some height. So leave uh, some clear gap, clear gap between these two footings at the bottom of the Strap. So in that case, the soil will be over here. So there will be gap between soil as well as the bottom of the strap footing and there will be no pressure. Okay, next is strip footing or continuous footing. So used for foundation of load bearing walls. So most commonly strip footing is used for load bearing walls. So if we have a load bearing wall, so the footing under this wall will be a strip footing. It is also used when pad footings for number of columns are closely spaced. So if we have a num number of columns and the isolated footings or pad footing for these columns are closely spaced, so in that case, to minimize the farm work cost, we can combine these footings to make a strip footing. So like here as well as like here. So all use you also used on weak ground to increase foundation bearing area or if the soil is weak, so in that case, to increase the bearing area, we can combine the footing of different columns. 
so in that way we can increase the bearing area as a result the contact pressure will be reduced so fifth type of footing is raft foundation so it is a combined footing which cover whole building so we can provide a footing a combined footing or a footing like a slab over the under the whole building so it supports all walls as well as columns so useful it is useful where columns load are heavy or bearing capacity is low need large base so if we have large area requirement for the base of the column and these base of the columns are closely spaced in both the directions so in that case we can combine all these isolated footings to make a single footing so in that case the footing will be economized because less farm work will be required uh, as well as less detailing or less cutting of the reinforcement will be required so we can take the benefit of that and we can combine all those footings all those isolated as well as strip footings so this is one case and the other case if there is a chance of differential settlement so to avoid the differential settlement or if it is difficult to avoid the differential settlement so in that case we can use this raft foundations so as a result there will be less chance of differential settlement or such type of foundation can resist the differential settlement and the other possibility to use this raft foundation is if the soil is compressible if soil is compressible so definitely there will be more chance of differential settlement the columns having larger load are susceptible to more settlement so in that case the structure can have stresses because of the settlement and may have cracks so to avoid that type of cracks or failure we can combine all the footings all the isolated footings to make a raft foundation and as a result our structure will have equal settlement which will not harm the structure so the sixth type is pile foundations it is used when the soil conditions are poor and not possible to provide adequate spread foundations so if the soil is weak so in that case the required area for the foundation will be sufficiently large and sometime it becomes impractical especially in case of bridges when the property line is very narrow and the loads are heavy so in that case we cannot go for the spread footing so the only option in case of bridges is pile foundation so the more economic to be used when soil bearing stratum rock is deeper than the 3 meter so if the rock is not on the upper layer so the hard stratum is available at some distance or at some depth from the ground level so in that case we can use these piles pile load can either be transmitted to a stiff bearing layer by end bearing or by friction along the length of the pile so we can ha have two types of piles based on the soil condition if we have hard strata available so in that case we can use end bearing piles and we can rest those piles on that hard strata and the load will be transmitted by the end bearing and if we don't have any hard rock available at sufficient depth so in that case we need to use the friction piles so the load will be resisted by the friction between the pile as well as the soil so we need to use friction piles so we can have two types of piles precast or cast in situ so precast piles are driven into the soil while the cast in situ piles are bored and then casted we drill a hole and then cast the pile in that in that hole okay next is limit states and failure modes this will be covered in the next video